So Neuron was spun out from Pharmacia in uh, the end of the 90s of the last century uh, and it was all around an innovative class of compounds, so-called voltage-gated ion channel blockers. Uh, and with these innovative mechanism of action, uh, we have repositioned compounds which usually would have gone into epilepsy, and we've put them into Parkinson's, where we now have a unique label, and we put them into pain, and we put them into schizophrenia. Uh, that is three of our four development compounds. Uh, the fourth development compound we have licensed from a company who had taken it through a complete development in Parkinson's disease till the end of phase three, but had failed on the efficacy side of it. The value they passed on to us uh, was more than 2,000 patient safety data, patients who had been treated for up to four years. And as you know, a drug can fail on efficacy, lack of efficacy, and it can fail on safety and more than half fail on safety issues. So getting a drug that has gone through safety without any relevant issues is a huge value. What we did then is we repositioned it into a new indication, and that is indeed our first orphan indication, that's RET syndrome, a disease which affects about 35 to 40,000 girls in the United States and in Europe. Uh, and there's no treatment approved. It's a material neurodevelopmental disease uh, which uh, affects girls by a uh, mutation on the X chromosome. Now what will happen is that these girls will have a honeymoon of about two years time in which they develop completely normally and then there will be a phase of slowed down development which some parents might recognize, some doctors might recognize or not. Some will simply say don't compare to your peers, your neighbors, just don't do it. But then comes a phase of complete regression. The girls will forget what they learned. So they will make stereotype movements with their hands because they don't know any longer what to do with their hands. They, will, they might have spoken, usually at the age they, they will have spoken, they will forget how to talk. They will social, uh, socially isolate themselves and be mixed up with autistic kids. They will start having epileptic episodes and then they will develop what we call breathing abnormalities. So they will have dozens, up to 70, 80 series of apneic uh, attacks during the day and they might stop breathing for obviously no good reason for a few seconds or up to two minutes. So they will turn pale and blue and uh, turn unconscious. Oxygen saturation in the blood of those patients might go down from levels of 90% to as low as 50%. And that happens dozens of times a day. Not in all the girls, not every time that severe. But it starts at young age and obviously lack of oxygen is causing damage in the development and in the brain of those kids. Uh, I think that is little to be disputed. So most of the kids at age 10 will be wheelchaired. Uh, at teenage most of them will be lying in bed fed by G-tubes. They will require seven days, 24 hours care by at least one parent. And still we have to say those parents and those families that we see are absolutely in love with that child and would do everything for that child. Now unfortunately the parents have plenty of uh, visits in the emergency rooms because they fear the kid when it stops breathing might die. And indeed of the girls that are dying at age 37, 40% of the girls will have died. 25% of the deaths will be due to cardiorespiratory abnormalities. So patients and the parents rushing to the emergency room and a bitter message by the doctors is there's nothing we can do for you. So once diagnosed, the parents will be put in contact with the red organizations around the world. So we have some in the United States, we have one practically in every European country at least. And they will start learning what that disease is and they will start accepting and having to accept that there's little that can be done beyond physiotherapy and uh, loving and helping and caring for that child. Now, the drug that we are developing is the first drug ever that made it to the level of pivotal study. That is what we call a study that might lead to the approval of a compound. So there's an urgent need for more research efforts, money, attention, like the ice bucket challenge we had a number of years ago in ALS. That is what is urgently needed also for red syndrome like the other 9,000 rare diseases we know and we, we, we have only 5% of those diseases covered by approved drugs. 
So we have made it to that stage that if our ongoing study would be successfully completed, we might get an approval of the first drug ever dedicated to Red syndrome. And so this is what we are right now focusing most of our money and resources in the company on. Uh, we do not take any shortcuts in development of that compound. So what we do is, after discussions with the US regulatory authority, the Canadians and the Europeans, we are running a gold standard pharma development trial. We are doing a global study in 15 <coughs> study centers in the United States, in Europe, in Asia and in Australia. We are doing a six-month double-blind placebo-controlled study and we do a, a second six months follow-up safety extension in which all the patients who were on placebo before would qualify to get drug. And we are doing that in 129 girl, uh, girls, which sounds little but in an indication in which you only have 35 to 40,000 patients in Europe and the US, that's a huge number. And I think what we can say is that this study has reached a, a, a level of recruitment that within the next three to four months we might have the last patient into that study who will undergo the six months treatment and then there will be a one month uh, safety follow up for the last visit or to the last visit. That means by end of this year we would expect the results of that study. And if positively concluded, we have a fair chance that we can move on to filing and getting approval of that compound.